All right, I'm, we're going to carry on because we're talking about entrepreneurship and we're looking at what young leaders can do. Um, we were talking a little bit about social purpose in the last session. Let's just look directly now at how business can be redefined and redesigned for social impact. So we have with us uh, Nithi Pant, who's a co-founder of S4S Technologies. We've got Sophia Faisal, director co-founder of KEF Holding, and Devika Malik, um, international para-athlete and the co-founder of Wheeling Happiness Foundation. So thank you all so much for being with us. So let me, let me just start to talk about the entire concept of, you know, um, when you're looking at business, business is often people say business about making money, but business for social entrepreneurship, for so, uh, social impact, how does that, that make a difference? Share, share some insights in what you've done. Sure. So uh, social entrepreneurship is where you also drive impact along with financial sustainability. So impact is ingrained in your model. You don't have to do two different things for creating an impact and also giving financial returns. For us, our business model is structured that way, where we take the imperfect produce by smallholder farmers, uh, the ugly produce, cosmetically damaged produce, which does not get the right price in the market. Uh, we help them capture more value for, for their produce by uh, making uh, transforming farmers to become processors. So we help them set up small farm factories by providing them solar powered uh, solutions, uh, technology, access to finance for buying the technology and also market linkage. So whatever our women entrepreneurs and female farmers would produce, we would do quality control on that and sell it to large corporates such as Nestle or Mariko. So in Maggie noodles, if you would have seen some carrot and French beans, that's made by our women entrepreneurs. So it's a win-win situation for environment as well as people. All right, let me carry on. Um, yeah, so for me, I think everyone talks about business, about making money and, and growing an industry, but also I really see business as a responsibility to the industry of the society around you. Um, so when Pause started and we're a wellness space with a cafe, um, it's really about how do we get people to look after themselves, to prevent chronic disease, to prevent mental health issues. Um, came from a very personal story of I experienced depression myself, I manage anxiety. Um, this was how I found balance and I'm not shy or I don't have shame to talk about it. Um, and it's through finding purpose for myself that I was able to thrive. And that's really the intention about my business as well. It's how do I make others find their own purpose or their own balance um, so that a society thrives rather than just trying to make money. So money is part of it, but it's not the important part. Your exactly. primary focus was to help others yeah. benefit, perhaps in a manner that you, know, you wish somebody had helped earlier on in your own case. Exactly. All right, that's, 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 that's fascinating, Devika. So I'll put it this way, uh, we help you to make more money by getting that 16% of the world's population that lives with disabilities uh, ready for the workforce. What we do through Wheeling Happiness Foundation, whether we support uh, education or employment or something as simple as we support a person with disability to modify their car to be able to drive it to work so that they're not spending half of their salary in employing a driver. What that does is that there's 16% of the world that lives with disability in India, that is upwards of 10%. In the UK, one in every five person. And uh, there's a $1 trillion spending power that people with disabilities and their families have, which businesses are failing to target that consumer base. So what, what we are doing is, of course, uh, driving impact because uh, our entire passion and goal is striving towards enabling people with disabilities in the field of their choice, uh, ranging from sport to fashion to business. Uh, but at the end of the day, what that does is it creates empowered citizens and it creates uh, people with disabilities who are enabled to then give back to the workforce and helps you to harness uh, the skills and potential of this 16% of the population. Um, and it makes business sense. So again, practical impact, but it makes business yes. sense also. So I'm just going to come to some of the how do you actually do it. I want to come get those case studies because a lot of people say we want to make an impact. We want to do exactly what you're doing, but they don't know how to start, what, how to do it. So if you could just share some more detail, what do you specifically do and how did the ideas come about and how do you make that change? So it actually started with the spark of an idea that uh, there were people with disabilities 
who wanted to not just be on the receiving end of charity. They wanted to contribute to society. They wanted to live a more active uh, and empowered life, but they didn't know how because the environment is not accessible. The environment is not uh, created in a way that a person with disability can seamlessly step out of the house and go wherever they need to get to. And uh, my mother, who's also a wheelchair user for the last 25 years, she's here in the room with us. Uh, she lives a very active life. She's outdoors all the time. So people would come up to her, especially women, and ask her to you know, guide them on how, uh, how can we be this active with, with a limitation, with a disability, without a, bl a bladder and bowel control. How do you do it? So we would have people living in our home for uh, upwards of three weeks, just learning the tips and tricks, learning how to be more mobile, with disability and so we decided to scale this up into an organization and reach out to more and more people with disabilities uh, to empower them to teach them how to live a life which is mobile which is active and one of the key uh, ways that we found that we can do this is introducing people to sport and rehabilitation so sport works as a great tool for uh, rehabilitation and for people with disabilities to recognize that ability that they have within themselves, the ability beyond their disability. And then, of course, uh, from that recreational sport participation, it transitions into uh, some of them want to uh, you know, pursue further education or they're looking for employment opportunities. So when they participate in sport and say win a medal at the state level or the national level, and then they take their CV to an employer, they're taken more seriously versus uh, uh, you know looking at them as a disabled person with for whom they would have to make concessions uh, you look at it as a person who is here uh, offering their skills what you have to do is make some reasonable accommodations so that you can harness those skills and add it uh, to your business value right that's that's really fascinating it's a fascinating part so if I, again let's come to the some of the specifics of it so it started there was a wellness cafe, right, which was involved in this uh, when you were yeah. setting it up. And then, then what happened? So take us through the story. Um, so, yeah, so my sister and I started this together. And we both, this was the COVID baby. We were both back in our parents' house. Um, and we realized that we've been fortunate because she went through depression as well. But we've been fortunate that as a family, we had the support system to find what worked for us, what tools helped us. We started an Instagram page. That's really how it started. We both just started talking about what we went through, not from a, this is what we learned, so do this, but this is our journey. We're not shy to talk about it so we can normalize it. The first, at least within wellness, especially in GCC in India, it's very top taboo to talk about things you've gone through or challenges you've faced, which I find weird because everyone goes through it. Um, so because we were so open, we got a lot of people just reaching out to us, a lot of children. Um, one person was actually close to committing suicide messages saying, you guys value well-being or mental health. I'm talking to you because I have nowhere else. No one in my family will understand me. And he's fine now, but that really got us to think about, okay, we're doing something that we're, we're, we're resonating with young people. How do we create a community space around this? Um, so the cafe food is culturally as well is the first touch point for a lot of people, right? Um, especially during COVID connection was lost. Everyone was feeling lonely. That's still a problem. Um, so the cafe was the first idea, but then the different aspects of wellness was what helped me and my sister. So movement, meditation, self-care. So we do treatments and pause. Um, but at the core of it all is education, right? Awareness of how do you manage thoughts? How do you identify stress? How do I set boundaries with my parents? These are all things everyone goes through and we wanted to figure out how do we get younger people to take it seriously. Um, in your 20s and 30s, you're not worried about diabetes or thyroid or heart condition. But in your 20s is the most important time where you need to learn what works for you in terms of your well-being, not what society expects of you first, because that's also how we're programmed to be. It's like, I need to be this or this or this as a good daughter, wife, whatever, right? Um, so we wanted to flip the message saying, think of yourself first, think of what you need and what your purpose is, and everyone else around you will thrive. Um, and how do we make it accessible? So the business model really came from a very pure, genuine purpose of how do we help people. Um, but I'm also an engineer. I'm a very systems thinker. Now, how do we design the business in a way where we're affordable, but wellness is an expensive industry. Running a wellness space is expensive. 
Uh, we've designed enough treatments. So our talks are five pounds. Our treatments are 100 pounds, but we offer different things for every single person. So anyone can come into pause. Um, the whole point is it's just a space for you to come and explore what your balance is. Um, and, and so that's how we've designed the whole business. But it's interesting that it started off from just an Instagram page. So therefore, yeah. when somebody says, how do I help? You can actually start to help with an Instagram page, exactly. which is actually yeah. a very important yeah. and a very valuable lesson from that. And yeah. especially at a time, I think COVID did throw a lot of people off balance. So I think it's, uh, it, it, it's really useful. Your story, and let's, let's go into it uh, in slightly more detail. Yes, I think uh, when we used to go to the Mandi, the markets where we saw the farmers used to get the produce in the morning and by the evening, if it was not sold, they would just throw it away because they did not have any ways of preserving the produce. It's perishable in nature. There is pr price volatility. Uh, at the same time, for the longest time, the photo of a farmer for me was of a male figure. But as you start working in the rural parts of India, you see that it's the women who's running the household and also working on the farm. And for any manufacturing activity to thrive, you need like a lot of electricity, which is unviable. So we started working at this intersection of uh, preventing food wastage, helping uh, women get dignified livelihoods, also energy access. So we started giving them dehydrators, which is just increases the shelf life of the produce by 12 months. And you, uh, we told them, use it for your own uh, consumption. But we re later realized what farmers told us was that either help me increase my income or decrease my cost, which means help me fa find market for my produce. And that's when we started taking whatever they were making, which was dried chiku, uh, dried onions, uh, great uh, corn grits to different uh, food and beverage industry. And that's where we realized that large corporates want to work with farmers, but no, they are too fragmented. And they told us that, why don't you aggregate this produce, take the responsibility of quality as well as reliability of supply and start supplying, sub supplying us this. And that's where our journey started. So uh, the reason that's, that that's a very fascinating area for you to be in, because a lot of people actually believe that things like farm, things like agriculture, things like what it takes to make a difference to the life of farmers, it's all very big things, right? The government and you need farm law reforms and politically sensitive. Um, is there a lot of openness to change? Absolutely. And therefore, can you help in getting some of those economic reforms through that have been pending for a while, especially in the farm sector? Yes, I think the, the, the business case to it is that first help people earn and then take a part of it. Do not, we are not relying on any government subsidy. Uh, this is basically just operational efficiency, seeing what uh, cost of energy that can, be, that can come, out, uh, come out. So really helping people get a dignified livelihoods is all about being very close to the customer understanding what their needs are, going very deeper in these geographies and finding a financial sustainable business model for it. I'm just curious, in a lot of the businesses that we are talking about, a lot of the impact that you're making, what is the gating problem? Is it getting the people to help you doing it? Is it getting the idea popularized? Or is it access to money, access to capital? What do you think is the biggest issue? I think the space that I work in, it starts with the uh, mindset. It starts uh, on a cultural level where uh, we're, uh, bound to look at people with disabilities as uh, recipients of charity, as recipients of help. Uh, we're not looking at them as uh, people we can enable to actually contribute to the workforce. So that mindset change is something that we are doing at the grassroots with a lot of advocacy and awareness programs. And once that mindset change starts happening, once you uh, kind of convince a family of a disabled girl child that uh, you don't have to be afraid to send her out into the world, and when they you know, come, on the, come onto the sports ground and see that their girl child with a disability can actually play sport, or uh, when you convince a school to modify their infrastructure enough that a young uh, woman on a wheelchair can access education in that school, that's where the change begins. Because I can talk at the level of uh, you know, a corporate not hiring enough people with disability, but are we creating that pipeline? Uh, are there enough people educated in those fields that they can then vie for those jobs and create that confidence within the employer that uh, we've, we've seen enough of this kind of person? Because anything that you see for the first time, anything that stands out to you is bound to create some anxiousness, some insecurity. So when we expand that pipeline 
from the grassroots onwards, when there's enough people with disabilities, young children with disabilities, who are able to access education without it being a, a whole story of inspiration. Just because I'm going to school and getting an education on a wheelchair, I'm not a role model, I'm not an inspiration. You don't want people's sympathy and pity and charity. Yes. I think that's a very important thing. That yes. You, that, that so is. at the very grassroots, we are changing that and we are uh, working to create a pipeline of employable, uh, productive citizens with disabilities who can contribute to the workforce just as anyone else can. So if, if I could just take that forward with you also, because this is one of the things that when you're going out into rural India, which I did a fair amount during the elections, we hear this from a lot of people. We don't want charity. We don't want handouts. We don't necessarily want food, free food grain. We want a job. We want status. We want to have a, a productive place. We don't want, if you're a farmer, we don't necessarily want handouts, yeah. but we want to make sure we want a fair price. Is that what you hear a lot of? Yes, uh, talent uh, and skill is available everyone. All they need is a platform. They need opportunities that are not available and maybe comes from, with a lot of privilege. And that's what we need to open for them is br meet them where they are, not expect them to, to come where the opportunities are. So create livelihoods uh, closer to the villages, find, find work for them, help them become more climate resilient. I think these are the things that we see. The question of stigma, of course, is particularly important in some of the work that you did. A lot of people don't talk about things like depression and anxiety because there's an associated, there's, they are concerned about talking about it, you're referring to it. The more the conversation happens around it, the more, for example, well-known people like Deepika Padukone coming out yeah. and speaking about it, does that make a difference? Because then suddenly, it, as you were saying, it normalizes things and people can talk. And the minute you start talking, you start seeking help. And when you talk about it and you seek yeah. help, you solve the problem. Yeah. But I, potentially. I, I really think talking about it more helps people um, because it instantly lets you know that you're not alone. When you feel alone is when you're at your most vulnerable and you, you, you don't have control over your thoughts at that point. As soon as you know that, oh, someone gets me, that in itself is a relief. Um, and that's what we do. So in pause every Saturday and Sunday, we do this thing called matcha mornings. Um, again, five pounds. We pick a topic. A bunch of strangers come and talk about their story, their perspective. Um, topics like, are you really grateful in your life? How do you balance work-life balance? How do you deal with family pressure? So things everyone faces. Um, if you're coming, you're choosing to either listen. A lot of people don't even speak. They just want to know that there are others who think, you know, along the same lines. Or someone else will come to vent. They're like, just talk. Um, it's not therapy. We just say it's a safe space where you can feel heard. And that's what people really want. It's more than therapy. It's people just want to feel heard first. Um, and so I think people like Deepika talking about it, um, just influencers talking about it is, is crucial for... Um, for this to normalize. All right. Uh, thank you, Nidhi, Sophia, Devika. Thank you so much for that. And congratulations for the work that you did. And for anybody wanting to make an impact, I think we've got some really inspirational stories out there as to how all of you can go out and make an impact. It's not just about making money. It's about making an impact as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.